Hey, Internet. Welcome to Worldview Everlasting. Your favorite. Hey. If you've got an iPhone, a smartphone, an iPad, an old-fashioned, you know, rotary film camera, I don't care. Go ahead and take some video of yourself and your friends being as weird as you can think of. Hmm. I wonder if this will work. Southern Illinois truck drivers love Worldview Everlasting. Wait. Wrong show. And you're be listening to World of Everlasting. We'll be taking your false doctor now. Arr! Wait, that doesn't work either. I have a plan. Hmm? To Worldview Everlasting. Welcome. Favorite YouTube addiction. It is... <laughs> It was awesome. This episode of Worldview Everlasting is brought to you by the letter awesome. The numbers sweet action and issues etc. Talk radio for the thinking Christian. Issues etc. Org. But it's Friday, and you know what that means. It's time for. Uh -oh, uh -oh, uh -oh, email. Uh -oh, email. But before we get there, just an update. I am, oh, at long last, going to take a little bit of vacation. So for the next three weeks, I'm uh, not gone three weeks, but for the next three weeks, there is going to be no show. We're going to come back at the end of August with a full reboot, starting over two shows a week, just like you're used to. But until then, you just got to kind of, well, find something else to do for the summer. Uh, my YouTube channel, I may be uploading some family videos and so forth, but it won't be anything quite as cool as... Rainbows on fire! Well... We'll be taking your fast doctor now. that. <laughs> So, right on, here we go. First question today isn't a question, it's a video. You might have seen this thing floating around the internet a little bit, and uh, well, it's just kind of, sometimes the patterns just start to bother you. Shadows fill an empty heart As love is fading Of all the things that we are Are not saying can we see beyond the scars and make it to the dawn? Now what you see going on right here is that she has identified being a Christian with being a good person, with keeping the law and the commandments. So last time we talked a little bit about how Christianity doesn't abolish the law, like we actually still believe there is good and evil and like being good is, you know, good and so we should try to do it, but that that's a very different thing than say being saved because of that or that that is your identity in Christ, that you actually are a good person in your own merit. And this is what unfortunately the kind of Christianity that she has been involved in, which I would call really a false Christianity. There are true Christians in false Christianity but the teaching's false. It's based on lies that Jesus never said, the apostles never said, but it leads to, well, what she's going to experience now and, unfortunately, the pattern of what she's going to say after this. But at this point, it's kind of like heartfelt, right? I mean, wow, this is a person who has been taught her whole life that she's got to be good and she's going through the realization that she's not. Hardcore foundation of Lutheranism right there. No doubt. Welcome to life. Just amazing that so many Christian churches will sit there and tell kids stories about Jesus and then use every single story about Jesus to tell them that A, God loves them, so B, they're supposed to be good. The emphasis is on the supposed to be. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> Rah. And as these kids get a little bit older, they are living life just like you and me, and they start to realize that in order to keep up appearances in the church, in the congregation, by church they mean the, the group of people that they happen to hang out with who do read the Bible together sometimes, to keep up the appearances of being good, they have to start lying. First to themselves, but then they realize I'm lying to myself, and that means I'm lying to others, and it becomes, well, this thing we call guilt. Well, that's what the law does. The law does create guilt. In fact, St. Paul even tells us at one point that the law increases the sin that we actually commit. Not that the law is the cause of sin. Does that which is good cause my sin? No, the cause of sin is in me, my own incurvatus, curved inward selfish flesh, the fact that from Adam, originally sinful, I hate God and my neighbor, and it's just who I am. I mean, bummer, huh? That's the cause of sin, but the law, when it comes and it sets this bar, and we're like, I'm gonna get to this bar, I'm gonna get to this bar, we have to start sinning more to try to get to the bar. So in order to try to prove that we're good, we actually increase our evil, with the result that if we're in any way honest with ourselves, or well, about the time that we wear ourselves out, we find 
that we're not just failures, uh, we're hypocrites and liars too. But that's coming. Oh, but I gotta stop right there. So, like, notice how she's saying that Christianity is like, you know, a pretty cloak, maybe a white robe over a dirty body, but that, like, this is a bad thing, like, somehow this is wrong. See, she never even realized that this is what makes Christianity good. Of course, for her, she's not talking about the white cloak of Christ's righteousness. She's talking about the whitewashed tomb of her own righteousness painted over a grave full of dead bones. But Christianity is a white cloak over a dirty body. It is the cloak of Christ's righteousness covering your filthy shame. Not to make you perfect now, but to give you what you can't get for yourself, life. Anywho. Yeah, because the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? That's what Jeremiah said. Spot on. The inclination of a man's heart is only evil from his youth. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Hmm, let's find out. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. You know, I was in a conversation the other week with a guy who called me up. He's an agnostic. He heard me on issues, etc. Wanted to chat with me a little bit. And we talked about the resurrection, some other things. Kind of in a place like this girl, a little different. Now really isn't a Christian anymore, but had some questions. Great conversation. Talked for about two hours. At one point we were talking about hell though, and he caught me off guard because after I talked about, well, based on what you're saying to me, you know, you do know that you're choosing hell over Christ and, and resurrection and life eternal. And he fixed me with kind of an angry eye and he said that makes you happy doesn't it and I really didn't know how to respond to that it, it never crossed my mind in my life maybe it's just you know the blessing of having been born and raised a Lutheran and then when I fell away coming back into the church through Lutheranism and that's just kind of the ethos of Lutheranism but I mean who's happy that people are going to hell and that there's a Christianity out there that actually teaches you to think that's great I mean the oh just terrified me and I looked back at him and said yeah no I, I, I don't think that makes me happy I'm actually kind of bummed about it I mean you seem like a nice guy and all we're having this good conversation and you no know, it's just a matter of well Jesus rose from the dead and you don't believe it and that's kind of a rough thing and all but I can see how this kind of based on him and then and then her how this kind of tears up individuals because it's you know, Christianity is not about hate and that's where she's going to go with this video it's not about hate and she's absolutely right in that the problem is well if Christianity is not about hate then what is Christianity about is it about love well sure yeah who's love is it about your love hmm. I forgive you 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 I forgive you. 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 That's good. You should never take false teaching. Don't flee from it. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing. So your job as a young girl who's a Christian is to go change the world. I wonder where you got that idea. Oh, I know. You got it from something called the church growth movement, which essentially teaches, starting with the foundation, that if the church isn't growing, then it's dying, and therefore the Holy Spirit's not there. And so it's the task of Christians and pastors everywhere to make sure the church is growing at all times. And this happens by making you convinced that you're a missionary and your primary task, your primary vocation in life is to go out and make other people into Christians. Now, this all kind of like feeds on something that is really good. Like, it's not bad to tell other people about Jesus and that he rose from the dead. I mean, it's just, you know, the truth. And it will be something which carries the Holy Spirit into the hearts and minds of others so that they're regenerated and they do become Christians. So if you do confess Christ, like, that's awesome and all. But it's not like it's your job. Your job is not conversion. I'm a pastor. My job is not conversion. The only person whose job it is to convert other people is the Holy Spirit. What we do is we love the Word of God. We dig into the Word of God. We believe the Word of God. We preach, teach, confess the Word of God in community, in our homes and families and yes, as other people might ask us, in our lives with our neighbors. And the Spirit is promised to be living and active in the midst of that word, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing joint and marrow. That means even piercing, sinful, broken, wicked to the core, hearts and wills, and binding them to Christ in death and resurrection so that a new will is born even in that moment. But that's not your job, right? And if you think that your job is to go out there and make other people be Christians, I mean, yeah, no wonder you're fighting a battle you can't win. Doubly so, and I gotta say this, if you're teaching and preaching the church 
first growth gospel, which tends to be coming out of the Baptist tradition. Now, not all Baptists necessarily believe this. I mean, sadly, you can't point to anything that says what all Baptists believe because they don't believe in creeds. But, you know, coming out of the Baptist tradition, the idea that by convert an atheist, that means make him a good person, right? It's not so much about letting the truth that Jesus has risen from the dead for the forgiveness of sins and the life of the world just kind of be out there, that we just put it out there and whatever happens, happens. But the idea that your job is to transform civilization itself, to transform society, to transform other lives, to prove that you've got a transformed life yourself, to change the individual. And so it's about actually saving the atheist yourself and saving him from his present predicament, that he can't be who he is or what he is anymore. There's no concept of simply forgiving the atheist for who he is or what he is and loving him anyway and recognizing that in this, connected to the word and sacraments of Christ, there is atheists who will come to believe, no, 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 it's different than that. It's your job to fix the world. Well, yeah, no wonder you got tired, you know? I mean, seriously. And it's no wonder that church growth theology as a whole tends to burn out both pastors and people, especially young people. It's kind of amazing. The boomers seem to have like this uh, resiliency to it. I think it's because they just like strumming their own guitar in front of people half the time. Well, no offense and all, it just kind of seems that way from where I'm sitting. But like the young people, if you're watching, you know, this next generation that I'm kind of in and like the, the 20 year olds under me are like definitely in, they're doing what this girl's doing. They're just kind of getting burned out and they're going where she's going to go, which is kind of ironic. It's where revivalism always goes. It's where charismaticism always goes. It's this gnarly thing called liberalism. Check it out. Pharisees and Sadducees, hypocrites. I came to cast fire on the earth, and I would that it were already kindled. Do you think that I have come to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vanity do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the opinions of men. Woe to you, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Woe to you, for you travel across land and sea to make a single convert. And when you convert him, you make him twice a child of hell that you are. Woe to you, blind guides, blind fools. You tithe your mint and your cumin, but you neglect the weightier matters of the law. Woe to you, you clean the outside of the cup, but the inside is full of greed. Now I could go on and show you more places where Jesus, in love for his enemies, tells them the truth, which in fact is a bit harsh at the time. Which is, interestingly enough, exactly what this video is doing. So she's gonna get to a point where she's gonna say we shouldn't be judging anybody anymore. And notice what the video is doing. It's judging you. And it's doing it in a very nice way attempting to kind of convert you to a new way of thinking and bring you along to, in fact, change you. So look at that, though. Nothing's in fact changed in her actual position other than now no longer is she going to preach Jesus as Savior. She's going to preach Jesus as teacher who teaches love. <laughs> The question then is, so all this work to clean the outside she was doing, like things that we are, are not all this work that she was doing, like none of that was love? Well, what, what commandments were you following? I mean, I mean, the 10 commandments I read, they're pretty much about, you know, loving your neighbor. Hmm. I tried to love, I tried to love, I tried to love by trying to keep the commandments, but I couldn't, I failed. So now I figured out that Jesus said, love your enemies. So now I'm going to love, I'm going to keep the commandments. And this is the fearful, terrible, horrible thing about law-based religion. The opinion legis, the opinion of the law that tends to be written on our hearts, which is that somehow we can in fact save ourselves one way or the other, is that it has this habit in revivalism and church growthism, especially of every generation, having to rebel against itself and fix everything that came before and the way it does it is it says, oh, look at all those laws. What a bunch of hypocrisy. And then it turns around and it says, now we're going to do the right kind of law. And Jesus is used as a foil in the middle. It's, we're doing this because Jesus said to. But then see, the things Jesus said about himself, who he is, what he did on that cross for you, what baptism means, what the Lord's Supper does, what we're waiting for as Christians, that part just kind of trickles right out of the middle. And what do you know? <laughs> So yeah, now it's, I hate the law, I can't do it, I tried to be a perfect good Christian and I just can't and now I'm going to. Nothing's changed, it's all about the law. Except that now my job is to change you to believe something different than what I used to change you to try to believe. Hmm.
recognize that this is a judgment and this is your attempt to change somebody else. And you know, I'm actually not against that concept. And I'm with you in the fact that the false teaching you came out of was like horrid and just totally demolished your faith because it never actually lets you believe who you are as a sinner. And so then salved you with grace instead of kept telling you you had to climb the rat wheel to heaven. But don't think that you're not judging other people and don't think that you're not setting up a bar that you're gonna have to hop over. You've just said, I failed, I failed, I failed, but here's my new bar. Ah, for you out there, you know, you haters out there that think I'm hating on this girl. I'm, hey, haters! I'm not hating on her, man. I just, I feel for her. I know what she's going through and I don't want her to like totally lose her faith because what she's doing is setting a step, one more step in a repeated pattern that happens over and over again in the history of theology and it does lead eventually to abandoning the faith altogether. And ah, Jesus died for you. <laughs> he rose for you. That's love. If you don't have that, you are nothing. This is love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice. And I don't say that to prove that I got a Bible verse memorized. I couldn't even tell you where it's from. I think it's in 1 John. Strange thing, you know, Lutherans, we used to be about Bible memorizing like the rest of them. We really dropped the ball on that one. But, you know, it's not like a game to see how much you can do. You don't earn your righteousness by being a good apologetics arguer. That's not the point of any of it. The point of all of it is what love really is, which is not, hey, I just like you cuz it's forgiveness it's willingness to overlook evil done against you because God has overlooked the evil you have done against him so that like a servant who's been forgiven a giant debt a bigger debt than you could ever pay back you are willing and able to forgive other debts against you which are far more insignificant when compared to what you owe but does that mean that I just kind of got to be a nice person and never tell the truth about who Jesus is what he's done and what it means for our world is that what love is is just kind of you know Jesus is fuzzy nice teacher guy I mean that's where this is going I hate to say it but it is well, gosh, get married. You know, I got the best wife in the world, and I know it's a chore for her to love me. <laughs> That's kind of the whole point. Love's a verb. We're talking human to human love. Love's a verb and it's very much a chore. It precisely defines doing the good thing for your neighbor that you don't want to do because of your evil self, but because you know it's good for your neighbor. Feeling happy towards other people, that's not a chore as long as they're the other people that you like. But see, when it's the people you don't like, like, oh, you know, James, that guy who killed all those people last week, feeling love towards him is something you're pretty much not capable of. I mean, I'm not capable of it. It's just not easy to love him. It's a chore to love him, pretty much, period. And understandably so. So it's really a nice sentence and all that love is not a chore you know all you need is love loving's what I got it's just not true not in the real world so you remember you were trying to be good and build up this whitewashed pretty picture of how good you were and how you were able to do all this stuff and everyone was telling you how you should do that and this was what Christianity was really about and then you tried and it just destroyed you well, that's what you're doing now to other people you're giving them this bar and you're saying yeah see you can do it it's easy I've done it yeah And they're like looking at their hearts and they're saying, you know, no, I, I don't really just love other people naturally all the time. It doesn't seem to come out. Oh. And this is classic liberalism kind of buried within that the whole purpose of the cross was to show you how much God loved you, which is kind of true, but that's not really all that it is. So like what the cross is, is just like this giant love letter from God. He stretched out his arms this much and this is how much he loved you. And so this is just the proof of what real love really is all about. But it's kind of funky. It's like, so how does dying on the cross show me what love really is? How is that loving of Jesus that he just let some other people beat him up and kill him? Because, right? It's not. And this argument falls within liberalism super fast. The liberal themselves don't like it because they realize you now uh, if this is God showing what love is that love is to kill your own son or let your own son be killed just cuz to show what love is I don't want any of this kind of love you know and this is where the emergent church much of the emergent church some of the emergent church is going these days and they're asking these questions saying that's not love at all you know kind of hateful and what a horrible God this Christian God is and, well guess who's setting the stage for that kind of understanding what she just said, yeah. Now it's true, Jesus did reveal his love on the cross because in that he revealed what God will do to punish sin and what God will do to make sure that the punishment for sin doesn't fall upon you. That's love. This is awesome. So now we've got to go to a false teacher and a false religion in order to teach Christianity that Christianity is really about love. Yep, Gandhi said it, and isn't that great? He figured out that Jesus was a great moral teacher whose real purpose was just to get people to love each other, and uh, he pretty much failed because the Christians missed the point. All of them. Well, maybe not all of them, but most of them, you know? The thing is, when Gandhi says that, he's only reading the Bible as a liberal critic would read the Bible, that is, selectively, just taking the pieces that he wants, because he's ignoring all of that I am the way and the truth and the life stuff, I am the resurrection, 
resurrection stuff. He's ignoring all of that son of man must suffer and die and rise again stuff. When Gandhi said, I like your Christ, he did not mean I like the fact that he rose from the dead. Gandhi did not believe that he rose from the dead. Gandhi believed in pacifism as a response to violence, as a way of overcoming tyranny within a social setting. That's it. That's what he liked. And he saw Jesus as one attempting to do that. And so he tried to do it himself as well. He saw Christianity as a movement that understood that, at least initially, that it's all about pacifism as love. And that is where classic liberalism tends to want to go into social revolution, empowering of the lower classes, and a sort of like happy peace, let's shake hands and not fight anymore. Which, you know, I'm all for like shaking hands and not fighting anymore. The problem is when you run into somebody who just says, pow, and like that's his response to your wanting to shake hands. At that point is the role of government to not, you know, defend the people. Um, well, that's a different topic altogether. But if you got to go to Gandhi to like prove Jesus is worth listening to, Jesus ain't worth listening to. <laughs> You know? And by the way, wasn't that kind of like a judgmental statement? that he doesn't like us Christians. I mean, kind of hurts like deep down in, in the core. I mean, why? Because I repent of my sin and believe Jesus is my savior. You don't like me? Well, I guess Jesus did say, if the world hates you, it hated me first. Hmm. Oh, those people. That's not a judgmental statement. Don't be like those people. See, has anything changed from the beginning? You know, all the things she confessed that she didn't like, notice how she's still doing it. Notice if you're watching, you're still doing it because the law can't save you. That means love can't save you. Only thing that saves you is Jesus. But really, this is not so new. This is like 200 years old and, you know, this cry to start the love thing, it's been going on for a while and I hate to break it to you, it's not going to work. It doesn't work. It feels really nice and chummy for a while and then it buckles under its own weight as it kind of gets bloated and becomes its own organization, but has nothing really to pass on and so the people underneath it rebel against it, say, let's start the love and then go on and do it all over again. And if that's what church is, you know, I want no part of it. <laughs> no way. Got better things in life than helping support an organization as it creates itself out of a movement. Rah. But... It's not about what you do, it's about Christ for you. And uh, we're definitely out of time. <laughs> Hope you've enjoyed, I don't mean to be a hater. Um, I just don't like being hated on by someone who says, I'm not a hater anymore, so you're a hater. I mean, it's just like, well, <sighs> quoting you shall not judge is to judge somebody else. And I just kind of, you want to not judge other people, live under the cross of Christ and proclaim that his judgment is complete, that God's judgment in that cross is total, that you are damned in your flesh, but you are saved entirely freely as a total gift. Not up to you. Jesus did it in his flesh, which is already risen and coming again to give this gift of eternal life to you very, very soon. Rock on. Stand here. If you will not turn to the dark side. Yes, she will. I don't think so. What's that? You, you, you will? Oh, okay, we're going to act it. I didn't know. Oh, no, no, never mind. Yeah. <laughs>